ESPN. This is Open Line with today's host, Father John Tregilio. In North America, call toll-free 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. You can also text the letters EWTN to 55000 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. Welcome again to Open Line here on EWTN, where we have a different host every day of the week. How about that? Jack Williams normally with you at this time. He is away. I'm Tom Price. I am not away. Glad to be with uh, (laughs) our very own Open Line Monday host, Father John Fragilio. How are you, Padre? I'm doing fine, and I'm a little bit older since the last time I was here. Is that a fact? (laughs) How did that happen? I turned 60 on March 31st. Well, congratulations and a very happy (laughs) birthday to you. Thank you. Did you uh, celebrate in any uh, any special way? Oh, yeah. When I was at Father Briganti's in New Jersey, they had a nice dinner and and cake. And then when I came to the seminary to work, uh, they had a huge uh, display. The the cook made... uh, uh, Zapoli, where Italian cream puffs filled with cannoli cream, Ooh. and the number, and they, they were supposed to look like the number sixty, and uh, they also then the guys from Harrisburg Diocese got like, another cake, had a picture of me. That it's one of those edible pictures. Yeah, so, <laughs> they got tired of looking at me after a while. Sounds like a lot of fun, though. I bet that I bet that number sixty didn't last very long with all those uh, <laughs> cream puffs disappearing. No, they they dug right into it and went from a six to a G, so everyone wanted to know what <laughs> go meant. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Well, we've got uh, open lines for you right now. That's indeed why we call it open line, and our phone number is eight three three. 288-EWTN. If you have a question for Father John uh, regarding apologetics or anything else that you would want to ask a Catholic priest, 833-288-3986. If you're listening to us outside of North America, please dial the U.S. country code. Normally that's the number one. And then 205-271-2985. You can also text the letters EWTN to 55000. Wait for our response, and then uh, ask us uh, your brief question. Just well, All we need is your first name. Don't need full name or anything else. Just give us your first name and your brief question. Message and data rates may apply. And, of course, you can always shoot us an email. We'll get to one of those in a moment. Uh, the, the address is openline at EWTN.com. Openline at EWTN.com. Be sure you put Monday or Father John or apologetics, something like that, in the subject line. So, Father, we just received a question from Julia watching us on YouTube this afternoon. Are the writings of Marie Valtorta okay to read? The poem of the man-god confused me. I'm asking because a priest I follow is going to be giving talks based on her writings. What do you think, Father? Uh, well, they have, they have not been condemned, uh, but they've not been given the same sanction as some other of the writings so um, I always say, you know, read them at your, at your discretion. Um, there's nothing dangerous about them. But remember, this is private revelation. Uh-huh. And so it never can contradict, which is part of public revelation. Okay. So that's the only proviso I want for people to keep. All right. Caveat emptor, right? Yes. <laughs> All right. Very good. Francis wants to know, can I give my indulgences to souls in purgatory? Yes, you can. Um, you, in fact, that's a wonderful thing to do is offer up for the poor souls in purgatory. And uh, what you can do is ask that these be applied to uh, a loved one who, who's in purgatory, if they're in purgatory, because if they're in heaven, then the Lord will send it to someone else. And God forbid, if they're in hell, they'll still make sure that somebody gets that. So uh, you can ask that they be given for you or to a deceased uh, person ah. in purgatory. You just cannot apply to a living person. Okay, very good. Marion wants to know, priests used to make use of the paten. Why has that been done away with? Well, priests, uh, there's two kinds of patents. There's one that the priest uses at the altar that goes with the chalice, and that's where he puts the larger priest host on it. Uh, it's much larger than the one that we give to the lay people, uh-huh. and it's just so that it's easier to see. And it's easier for the priest to, uh, because it's breaking it in half. There's the other uh, patent that looks a, that looks just like the one the priest has, except it has a handle on it. And that's the one that the altar server uses 
when the priest is distributing Holy Communion, and that's to uh, in case the host misses the mouth or pops out of the mouth yeah. or whatever, or the person drops it out of their hand, it's to protect it from falling onto the floor. Sure, but these have not been done away with universally, have they? No, no. In fact, I mean, you're, you're allowed, I mean, obviously the priest has to use that to say Mass because he needs to keep the, the, the precious blood separate from the, the sacred host. So every priest must have a chalice and a paten. The communion paten uh, is optional, but it's certainly not uh, forbidden. It's not discouraged. I took uh, Holy Communion yesterday uh, for Sunday Mass, and uh, there was the altar server with the patent, so <laughs> I'm I'm very glad he was there. I am, too, because I've had a number of occasions where, you know, uh, this is a good time just to remind people, when you do go to communion, if you're going to receive on the tongue, open your mouth and stick out your tongue because you we're not dentists and you know we have to go fishing around in there <laughs> you need to and keep your tongue flat i've had people curl their tongue uh barely stick it out or if you're going to receive on the hand you must place your hand flat and don't take it let the priest or deacon place it in your hand and then when his hands away then you take it and consume it got it all right thank you for that nathan says what is the benefit of going through the saints to pray to god Okay, it's certainly optional. It's not something that's um, uh, required or necessary, but it's most beneficial because just like here on earth, you would ask someone to pray for you. Technically speaking, a person could say to you, well, you don't need my prayers. You go to Jesus directly. And that's true, but it would be kind of rude, and it doesn't give the sense of solidarity that we're part of the communion of saints. And so we're honored if somebody says, yes, I'll pray for you, and they're interceding on your behalf to the one mediator, Jesus. And likewise, with the angels and the saints and the Virgin Mary, we're asking for their prayers, just like we would a living person here on earth. Okay, very good. And uh, Stephanie is watching us on YouTube this afternoon. She says, happy birthday, Father. What <laughs> Thank are, you. Yeah, <laughs> what are your thoughts on contemplative prayer? My local parish is having a group meeting. I was considered going to that. Well, good. Uh, Contemplation is the highest form of prayer. Uh, you start with vocal prayer, whether it's uh, words that you say yourself spontaneously or would you say out loud that, that we've learned as children, like the Our Father, Hail Mary, Glory Be, uh -huh. or uh, whatever. And then you've got um, meditation or me uh, mental prayer. And then the higher le highest level is contemplative prayer. Now, contemplation is something that you and I can aspire to. We can make our dispose, ourselves disposed to it, but it only happens when God wants it to happen. Whereas vocal prayer and meditation, we can do on our own. And uh, But if you don't reach that level of contemplation, it may not be your fault. It may just be that the Lord is not ready for you to enter into that phase. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for your kind wishes there, Stephanie. Appreciate that. Uh, here is a question from Maureen. If I have a Protestant friend attend Mass with me who has never been to Mass before, is it okay if I forego receiving communion to make them feel a little more at ease? Mm, I would say no, because you're denying yourself uh, something that is uh, necessary yeah. and beneficial to yeah. you. And I'm sure your friend would not want you to deny yourself something. It's like uh, if somebody has trouble breathing, are you going to stop breathing? Of course not. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, you, you're going to pray for them and say, look, uh, just take this time of prayer. Pray for me. Pray for all of us here. Pray for uh, the needs of the world and, and, what, and what, whatever. But um, I would not say deny yourself Holy Communion and just encourage you, because maybe that would be the occasion for your friend to want to receive communion yeah. by coming into full communion. Yeah, nice little teaching moment, isn't it? Exactly. All right. And Hank says, is transubstantiation based on Aristotelian concepts, and is that a cause for concern? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> okay. It is based on Aristotelian metaphysics. The difference, I mean, uh, Aristotle, and then, of course, is it fully explained by St. Thomas Aquinas, the angelic doctor. Um, Aristotelian metaphysics describes things as substance and accidents. And we're not talking about accident like spilling some milk or hitting another car. Accidents meaning the um, that's what is visible or perceivable by the senses. It's the um, the appearances. Whereas the substance is what a thing actually is. And so in transubstantiation, a changing of substances, the substances of bread and wine change into the substances of Jesus' body, blood, soul, and divinity. But the appearances, the accidents 
of bread and wine remain. So it still looks like bread, tastes like bread, looks like wine, tastes like wine. But what it is, that which makes it what it is, the substance has changed. And that's all based on Aristotle's metaphysics. So it was a good way of explaining what had always been in existence. All right, very good. Uh, Hank, thank you so much uh, for your email. And if you would like to send us an email for a future show, here is the address. Openline at EWTN.com. Openline at EWTN.com. Again, be sure to put Monday or Father John or um, even apologetics in the subject line so we can mix and match with, you know, attaching the right email for the right host. In a moment, we're going to be talking with Christopher in Dallas, Tim in St. Joe, Michigan, also Dave in Pittsburgh, Bob in Grand Rapids. Looks like two lines open right now at 833. 833- 288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Open line Monday with Father John Fragilio. Now here's today's quote for you from Mother Angelica's perpetual calendar. To know that the Father's wisdom is in every cross is faith. To know that everything that happens to us is for our good is hope. But to express our love for him in the midst of darkness and aridity is the purest love. Mother Angelica's Perpetual Calendar features an inspirational message for each day of the year. It's available from the EWTN Religious Catalog at EWTNRC.com. This Lenten season, read, reflect, and revive your faith with EWTN's National Catholic Register. Only the Register provides trusted news reporting and in-depth analysis that's always true to Catholic teaching. It informs, inspires, and equips Catholics to engage the world around them with the truth of the gospel. Let the Register accompany you, help you go deeper spiritually, and enrich your journey this Lent and beyond. Try it for free today and get it delivered to your home, office, or parish. Get six free issues today online at ncregister.com forward slash radio or call 800-421-3230 and mention code radio. That's ncregister.com forward slash radio or call 800-421-3230 and mention code radio. The National Catholic Register. Read faithfully. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question, call 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. Or send us an email to openline at EWTN.com. Hey, glad you could join us for the uh, Open Line Monday program with Father John Tregilio. Our phone number, 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Before we go to the phones, a quick word here about EWTN Radio Essentials, where you can listen for the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass celebrated every two hours. Believe it or not, 8 a.m., 10 a.m., Uh, 12 noon, 2 p.m. Eastern, uh, all the way through the evening. It's fantastic. Plus, rosaries, chaplets, stations of the cross, and other devotionals every hour. This is your teaching and devotionals channel, EWTN Radio Essentials. You can hear it on the EWTN app and by going to EWTNRadio.net. It's fantastic. All right, let's get to the phones right now. If you're ready, we begin here with Christopher in Dallas, listening on the great Guadalupe Radio. Hey, Christopher, what's on your mind today? Hello, good afternoon, Father. Yes, hello. Father. Um, yes, hello. Yes, hello. Yes. Go, go ahead. Yes, sir. Um, yes, Father, I'm, I'm calling because uh, just about the about four questions ago um, on the questions of sacrament of reconciliation, and me bringing in the, of course, the Holy uh, Sacrament of the of the Eucharist. Um, that question was that um, that the person not being or not taking the Sacrament of Reconciliation and her not uh, going for some reason and would she go into heaven? And you specifically said uh, you couldn't answer that question; only God could. And Further on was that um, Jesus gave us the graces of sacrament reconciliation to further us to come closer to him and to getting into heaven. But from a mortal sin, 
is in the church is that you wouldn't be able to receive Holy Sacrament of Reconciliation, uh, of the Eucharist, I'm sorry. So when a person not going to confession and not being able to receive the Holy Eucharist, that would further the person more from, from getting into heaven. And the state of grace is, wouldn't, wouldn't be as, as, as what Jesus puts it as and, and, and gives us. So doesn't it all apply that we have to go to second reconciliation and receive Holy Communion rather than us not taking um, confession? I mean, it, it, it contradicts me of the thought that her not ever getting into heaven that, that she could and, and it'd be God's choice. Okay, um, I, I, you may be talking about someone, uh, someone else because um, I don't remember answering that question. However, um, I can plug in <laughs> as best I can in this particular situation. Okay. Um, for us to be able to receive the benefit of Holy Communion, the Holy Eucharist, we must be in the state of grace. Otherwise, then even though we're receiving the real presence, it's really Jesus' body, blood, soul, and divinity, has no effect on us whatsoever because we've lost sanctifying grace and only the sacrament of penance and reconciliation going to confession we restores that. So without sanctifying grace, uh, the reception of Holy Communion has no effect on us, and that's by God's design. And so that's why a Catholic who, who knows their immortal sin must go to confession, and then confession opens the door, so to speak, so it's, um, and again, this is a horror, a bad analogy, but I have to use one anyway. Um, if, if Amazon delivers something, if you don't open the door, it stays on the porch. That's right. And so you got to open the door so that that package can come inside. And so you, the Holy Eucharist, Holy Communion can be received in a sense into your body, but for it to have effect on your soul, you must be in the state of grace. And therefore, it then makes you more disposed to actual grace. That empowers you to do uh, good things, good works. Um, and if a Catholic goes to communion knowing that they're in a mortal sin and refuses to go to confession, then they commit the sin of sacrilege. Okay. Well, we want to thank uh, Father John for quoting from the Gospel according to Amazon. I think that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm going to get some hate letters over now. <laughs> uh, I, I'm sure you do. Uh, Christopher, thank you so much for your call. That opens up a line for you right now at 833 833- 288-EWTN, one line open, 833-288-3986. Open line Monday with Father John Virgilio here on EWTN Radio. Let's go to Tim now. Tim is in St. Joe, Michigan, listening on Sirius XM, Channel 130. Hey, Tim, what's on your mind today, sir? Hi, Father. Hello. So this weekend we heard, we heard Jesus say, let him without sin cast the first stone. How did the church get from understanding that to being okay with um, heretics being burned at the stake and uh, capital punishment? Okay, well, that, that, that's an excellent question. Uh, first of all, um, when heretics were burned at the stake, it was not uh, the church who did it. It was the state itself, the king or the local civil authorities because at a time when there was only one church, say, for instance, in Western Europe, the Catholic monarch or the Catholic civil leader saw that uh, heresy was a danger, a threat to the stability of the kingdom. Because if there's one king, one religion, and then somebody's espousing uh, false teaching, it was a threat uh, to national defense, at least the way they perceived it. So the church, when they had the Inquisition, the, the uh, ascertained by investigation whether or not the person was truly guilty of heresy and then whether they were uh, non-repentant of it. And if they were, then they turned them over to the civil authorities and then they in turn uh, would impose uh, uh, the death penalty in the same way that they would impose the death penalty for other um, high crimes and, and, and uh, acts of treason against um, the, the state itself. Um, when you read the Catechism, you see that the Church has refined her teaching on uh, the capital punishment, the death penalty, that uh, while in theory uh, the state has the right, it's not an absolute right, and because of the modern uh, things we have available in terms of incarceration and treatment 
and all other uh, um, alternative uh, aspects of of penal remedy. It does not seem, and this goes back to John Paul the, the Great, Pope Benedict, and Pope Francis, that it's no longer uh, necessary to resort to that. Even though it was always a last resort, it doesn't seem that there's any particular need for it. Uh, that doesn't mean that all the acts of it done before were wrong, but there were instances where it was wrongly imposed, either unjustly, unfairly, it wasn't, it wasn't done uniformly, uh, many times poor people suffered more than, than rich people who could afford uh, a very expensive legal defense and so forth. Mm. Okay. Hey, Tim, thank you so much for your call. It is Open Line Monday with Father John Tregilio. Here is Dave now in Pittsburgh, listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Dave, what's on your mind today? Yeah, I wanted to know, um, why couldn't Christ raise St. Joseph from the dead when he died? I mean, was it because he didn't have the powers yet? He didn't have this, you know, the Holy Spirit? Or, you know, when he starts his ministry? Or, I mean, I just couldn't figure out why. I mean, he raised Lazarus. Why wouldn't he raise St. Joseph back? Okay. Uh, I, that's the first time I heard that question, but it's an excellent question. Yeah, yeah. Um, if anyone deserved to be the first one out of the grave, it would have been St. Joseph. Uh, remember, Jesus was always God in his divine nature. He's, he's God and man. Uh, his divine nature he had from all eternity, his human nature he received at the moment of his conception in his mother's womb. Okay, and uh, that he had the power doesn't mean he had to use it. And he raised Lazarus from the dead uh, as a sign of his divine power, but he could have raised Joseph, St. Joseph. But again, when he raised Lazarus, Lazarus died the second time because, uh, you know, he's not walking this earth anymore. And our goal is to be in heaven someday. And until the body is resurrected and glorified, uh, you know, that the body cannot enter into heaven, but the soul can. Now, St. Joseph, because he died before Good Friday, he had to remain with all the good people who were waiting to get into heaven, from Adam and Eve to Moses to even uh, Jesus' grandparents, Saints Joachim and Anne. Yeah. They had to wait, and he could have raised them from the dead as well. But physical resurrection was not the most important thing. Dying for our sins, being the Savior, the Redeemer, and then his resurrection, his resurrection of, of Lazarus was one of his miracles, like all the other ones he did, to show his divinity. But it wasn't that that was necessary for Lazarus himself and because he had to wait just as like Joseph did for the effects of uh, redemption and salvation that took place on Good Friday. Dave, thanks so much for your call. It's Open Line Monday with Father John Tregilio here on EWTN. Two lines open at the moment, 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Bob is in Grand Rapids, Michigan, listening on Holy Family Radio. Hi, Bob. What's on your mind today? Thank you. My question is, in God's omniscience, if I'm using the right word, mm -hmm. why, when he was speaking of Sodom and Gomorrah, did he say, I will go down and see if everything is true that has been reported to me? Okay, well, that, the reference to Sodom and Gomorrah uh, and also um, to other references that in that particular passage, what Jesus was saying that if Sodom and Gomorrah had seen what the people at the time of Jesus had seen and heard, they would have repented. Hmm. Um, this is one of the aspects of divine omniscience. Divine knowledge is so perfect. Not only does God know exactly, precisely what did happen and what will happen, but he also knows absolutely perfectly what would have happened. So if Sodom and Gomorrah had been around at the time of Jesus or if Jesus had been around the time of Sodom and Gomorrah, he's saying that they would have heard him, they would have listened, and they would have repented just like uh, happened uh, in Nineveh. So it's not a speculation. This isn't a hypothesis. Uh, this is a glimpse into per perfect divine knowledge. I see. All right. And uh, thank you so much uh, for that call. Here is Gary now driving through Kansas. Hey, Gary, what's on your mind today? Hello. How are you today? Very well. What's your question? Um, it's more of a, a request. <laughs> Um, I've got a grandson. He's 24 years old. Uh, they, they, he was never raised in the church. He's gone to church with me many times. Um, and he's had some questions for me that um, 
about the faith, and so I've suggested a few things to him, and he, he, he was kind of curious about some books that he could read, and um, years ago I read a book um, when I was in Vietnam, um, a, a book by St. Um, uh, Thomas Aquinas and and a few of them like that, that really... Okay, okay. Uh, we're, we're coming up on a break here. Uh, any any thoughts about books he could recommend there, uh, Father? Well, depending on how old his uh, grandson is, uh, the, we have just came out with the fourth edition of Catholicism for Dummies, and it's applicable for upper grade grammar school, high school, college, uh, full adult, and um, it just came out, and I know it's available at EWTN uh, on their religious catalog. Very good. Gary, you may want to check that out. Apologetics for Dummies. Lots more straight ahead on Open Line Monday with Father John Fragilio here on EWTN Radio. This is a Messy Family Minute with Mike and Alicia Hernan. Okay, I have a confession to make. I really do not like schedules. <laughs> Tracking what my family is supposed to do every minute, every hour, knowing where we're supposed to be. I don't even like the word schedule. If you feel the same way about family schedules, you are not alone. And yet, there does need to be order to our family life. Our God is a God of order. And let's face it, family life can involve a lot of chaos, right? We parents need to assist God in bringing some order out of this chaos. But if you don't like the word schedule, maybe it's because it sounds too industrial for the living reality of messy family life. What I do like is the word routine. That's what we aim to have in our family, a routine for when to wake up, when we eat, when we study, when we clean, and when we pray. A routine consists of what needs to be done daily, even if the timing or order changes because of life happening. Talk with your spouse about setting up a routine as part of the family board meeting and visit us at MessyFamilyMinute.org. This is Jack Williams. If you missed any part of today's show, catch the Encore tonight at 10 Eastern and check out the podcast anytime at EWTNRadio.net and click podcast. The EWTN home video highlight for April is Our Hermitage and In His Sandals. In both these programs, Mother Angelica uses her unique spiritual genius to crack open the mysteries of the Bible. Order your DVD and receive a free copy of Mother Angelica's book, In His Sandals, A Journey with Jesus at EWTNRC.com or call 1-800-854-6316. Hi, this is Cy Kellett, host of Catholic Answers Live. Join us today for two hours of questions and answers about the Catholic faith. Catholic Answers Live, 6 p.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio. Now back to EWTN Open Line. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. We are here for you at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833 833- 288-3986 and uh, just to prove that uh, Catholicism is for all dummies including me <laughs> I accidentally said apologetics for dummies that's wrong that's a different book uh, the one that you're talking about is the one that you've co-authored with uh, Father Ken Brigenti right yes Catholicism for dummies fourth edition <laughs> it's very good and I have it myself and I have referred to it it is a great great resource Catholicism for Dummies uh, by uh, Father John Tregilio and Father Ken Brigendi. Do check it out, and it's available from EWTN's religious catalog. So do check that out by going to EWTNRC.com, EWTNRC.com. All right, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. Here is uh, <laughs> Rosalinda now in San Antonio, listening on the great Guadalupe Radio. Rosalinda, what's on your mind? Uh, hi, uh, I believe a happy birthday is in order. Yes, um, thank you. <laughs> um, quick question. You were talking about the Eucharist earlier. Um, several months back, I have a senior-old son who actually did drop it. And w- I was, like, just done with COVID and everything, and it was on the floor, and I didn't know what to do. Um, thank goodness a friend of ours was ushering, and he, he just reached over a big tub and ate it. And I felt like, oh, boy, we got out of that one. But what are you supposed to do if you do drop it? I mean, what is the actual, I mean, I don't know. What do you do? Well, I'm glad you asked that because there is a procedure. And um, if you drop it on the floor, you are not obligated to consume it. 
So your health uh, comes first, and if it falls to the floor, then typically uh, the altar server who's got the patent, if it didn't stay on the patent, and that happens too, sometimes I've seen it bounce off the patent and wow. onto the floor. Um, what we would do is take, because it's still consecrated, take the host and then very reverently put it into the ablution cup that's filled with holy water, and then once it's dissolved, it can be poured down the sacrarium. Um, so you are not obligated to consume it, and neither is the person who gave you communion, whether it's the priest, the deacon, or the uh, extraordinary minister of Holy Communion. But it does have to be treated reverently. And then the spot where it fell, if it appears that maybe some fragments have fallen off, um, which doesn't happen a lot because mm -hmm. most of the hosts are very compact, but if yeah. it does, then you sh they should put like a little purificator that's been dipped in holy water and place it on top of it, especially if it's like carpeting where it could be uh, embedded. But you do not have to consume that. They should give you um, a, a fresh consecrated host, and then that host that fell should be taken care of respectfully and reverently. Rosalinda, thank you so much for your call. I think a lot of people are curious about that. Here is Anne now. Anne is in Lafayette, Louisiana, listening on Christ Our King Radio. Anne, what's on your mind today? Hi, Father John. I have a question I need to advise a friend on. Okay. My friend was not married in the church, but she did marry a man. It was his second marriage who had been. After they'd been married 15 years, at about... Three years after their marriage, he received an annulment from his first wife, her request. My friend has begged him to have their marriage blessed, and he doesn't attend Mass. He's not okay. really, doesn't practice, and he's refusing to do so. But she's so distraught because she can't go to confession. She can't mm -hmm. receive the Eucharist. She attempted to talk to priests. And she came to me last week after going to a Lent mission, just very upset, saying, I'm going to hell. That's what they said. It's a Lent mission. If I can't go to reconciliation, I'm doomed. And I was just so upset because I don't know what to tell her. And I just don't feel like God would send her to hell because she, her heart really wants, you know, she really wants to. Yes. Pretty much her hands are tied in this marriage. And she well, lost her husband. Here's here's what could, could happen, and I can't guarantee but it's something that is very possible and probable. If she was never, ever married before, if her husband that she's married to now, civilly but not sacramentally, if he was married before uh, in church and then got a, that marriage annulled, the decree of nullity, so now they're able to be married in the eyes of the church, and he refuses, she can still get what's called uh, a sonatio and radice, in which the bishop, in a sense, um, blesses uh, the marriage from the moment that they had initially uh, gave that consent, you know, although it wasn't sacramental, the bishop has that power to do that. So that is a possibility, especially since he refuses. All he re all that's required for them to have their marriage convalidated is that they both exchange consent before two witnesses. There's, there's no need for a formal ceremony. They, she doesn't have to wear a dress. They don't have to have a reception or anything like that. But if he refuses to have his vows uh, recited before a priest or deacon with her and two witnesses, then the Sanatio Radice is a possibility. So I would say call the diocese where, where she lives, have her call the diocese where she lives, and the tribunal can help her. Anne, is that helpful for you? That's very helpful. I hope I can remember that word, but I'm going to... Don't worry. You don't, you don't have to. <laughs> you don't have to. Just just remember, the, I mean, if you want to remember anything, remember Sanatio. But uh, she calls the tribunal. They can help her. They'll, they'll know what you're talking about. Yes, and they will. Thank you so much for your call. Here is Donna in New Jersey, listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Hello, Donna. What's on your mind today? Hi. Hi, Father Cecilio. Um, I just actually attended your Eucharistic presentation, and it was wonderful two weekends ago. Oh, in Flemington. And, um, <laughs> yes, it was wonderful. You and Father Regante, it was excellent. Uh, my question, I was going to ask you, but you were busy, is I'm having a lot of friends that I love dearly, and they are turning in a different direction, and they are moving toward the Latin Mass, they're feeling that Father uh, Pope Benedict is the only true pope, and <laughs> I'm feeling like I'm wondering how, when does this become schism or heresy when somebody feels this way, and they're telling me, oh, when you receive the Eucharist on your hand, that's wrong. Mm. You shouldn't receive the Eucharist on your hand, and I don't, 
really have the uh, the knowledge to to come back. So can yeah. you tell me something I can say? <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, we make a distinction between formal and material schism, just like we make a distinction between formal and material heresy. A formal heresy, formal schism, is where the person knowingly, willingly, and deliberately, um, in, in terms of formal heresy, rejects a teaching that they know the church teaches, and they reject that. They know it's heresy, and they, and they, and they purposely do that. Material heresy is where the person espouses a false doctrine but doesn't realize it. They're, it, they're sort of in ignorance. And the same with schism. You have somebody who formally, knowingly, willingly separates themselves from the authority of the Roman pontiff, and that's schism. Somebody could be uh, a material schismatic and not realize it. Formal heresy, formal schism is much more uh, dangerous and much uh, worse because it invokes, it invokes uh, involves the act of the will. And if you say, you know, there is no pope since Pope Benedict, you're schismatic. I mean, um, you don't have to like any particular pope, but we have to obey whoever is the legitimate pope. And, you know, Pope Benedict, you know, he, he resigned. You know, there's only been a few popes that have done that, but he's allowed to do that because yeah. he accepted the office and he can now turn it over. And Pope Francis was legitimately elected by the College of Cardinals, and he is the pope. And, again, you know, we have to – we're obligated to accept when he teaches ex cathedra on matters of faith and morals – we have to follow his uh, jurisdictional authority. That's Roman primacy. Uh, but in terms of his prudential judgments, it's the same as prudential judgments of Pope Benedict, Pope uh, John Paul, Paul the Sixth, any number, any any of the popes. Prudential judgments are a matter of personal opinion, but their teaching authority is very uh, delineated, particularly at the First Vatican Council. So your friends, you know, and you can like the Latin Mass. Some people like. Uh, charismatic masses. Some people like, uh, you know, all kinds of other masses. But as long as it's valid and listed, that's a, a, an old saying we say, had in um, philosophy class: "De gustibus non disputandum est," which basically means it's a matter of opinion. There's no argument. Okay, appreciate your call, Donna. It is Open Line Monday with Father John Tregilio here on EWTN Radio. Let's go now to Patrick, driving in Virginia, listening to Sirius XM Channel 130. Hey, Patrick, what's on your mind today? Hi. So that question uh, that came up before jogged my memory about um, a question my kids had that stumped me one time. Uh, they asked how how could um, the other two people in the Transfiguration, both of Elijah, have glorified bodies if Jesus hadn't uh, if Good Friday hadn't happened yet. And I kind of didn't know. <laughs> well, that's a good question. I'm going to put it on the exam for the seminarians yeah. <laughs> for their final exam. Um, Elijah and Moses did not have their physical bodies. These were apparitions. Just like when the Virgin Mary appeared at Lourdes or Fatima, it was an apparition. It means it was something sensible to their eyeballs, uh -huh. but it was not a physical manifestation of the glorified body. So even though Mary's body is in heaven, like Jesus's, um, Moses and Elijah, their bodies are still waiting for the general resurrection of the dead. But at the transfiguration, only Jesus had his body there. The other two, they, they appeared, and that's why they were apparitions. There you go. Patrick, thanks so much for your call. It is uh, Open Line Monday with Father John Tregilio. Hey, if you're up very early in the morning, my recommendation is check out Fire on the Earth. With Peter Herbeck, you'll hear it Monday through Friday mornings, 5.15 a.m. Eastern Time here on EWTN Radio. Fantastic program, a lot of great teaching every day of the week, Monday through Friday, 5.15 a.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio. Let's go now to Taylor in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, listening there. Uh, Taylor, what's on your mind today, ma'am? Hi there. Thank you so much for taking my call, and thank you, Father Tribulio. We really appreciate your wisdom and, um, and answers to so many, many, many different questions. Mine is, um, <clears throat> and mine is peculiar, I guess. <laughs> I, I, I really would like to know, you know, what, what is this with Pachimama and what was, was that business doing in the Vatican? I, I just can't, I don't get it. I don't understand it. 
Uh, yes, um, there's an example of a prudential judgment, okay? <laughs> uh, you and I don't have to understand it or even agree with it um, any more than you can agree with, um, you know, the, the Pope decides to wear certain things. <laughs> That's his discretion. Yeah. Some people don't like, they think he dresses differently than Pope Benedict. That's a matter of taste. Uh, the whole thing about Pachimama is caused a lot of consternation, a lot of misunderstanding, and some of it was intentional, some of it was not. Um, we have to give the benefit of the doubt, obviously, to the Pope because he is the vicar of Christ on earth. He deserves our respect, but we don't have to. We don't have to say, "Oh, I would do the same thing," or that I even liked or uh, agree with it. But I cannot attack him because he has the authority and the power, um, you know, to to do what he thinks best in the name of the church. But you know, just like in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, we had popes who did made some bad decisions, and some actually did some immoral things. I don't think Pope Benedict, excuse me, uh, I'm, I'm positive Pope Francis has done anything immoral, but his prudential judgments, just like people had the same about uh, Pope Benedict or Pope uh, John Paul, you know, that, well, he should have done this, he should have done that. Well, we're not allowed to be armchair theologians or uh, Monday morning um, pontiffs, you know. Yeah. Uh, we have to accept the, the authority as it is, but... Uh, what was going on with that? I don't know. Uh, I wouldn't have done it myself, but it happened. <laughs> Taylor, thanks so much for your call. Here is Nello in Chisholm, Minnesota, listening on the great Real Presence Radio. Hello, Nello. What's on your mind today? Hi. Uh, thanks for taking my call. I have a. When it comes to plenary indulgence, um, you know, one of, some of the stipulations: one, you need to have gone to confession. But then after that, it also says you have to have complete detachment from venial and mortal sin. So what is it in addition to already having gone to confession? How about an example of what is it to be completely detached from a venial sin? I mean, if you have yes. anger issues, you saying you will never be angry again? Or, I mean, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. No, I understand. And that's a good question because a lot of people don't understand completely what is meant by that a complete detachment from venial sin. What it means is that I I cannot even have a fond memory of a venial sin. Mm. And that's very difficult. That's why plenary indulgences are not that easy, but they're possible. Okay, so you, you aim for it, you try to receive it, and if you have good intentions and you're in the state of grace, it will def, it will default to a partial indulgence. Uh -huh. It's not the full remission of, of temporal punishment due to a sin, but it'll be a, a partial one. But there's a possibility of it being a plenary indulgence, which is the full remission of all temporal punishment due to sin. But to get in that state, you must you know, fulfill the obligations of confession 21 days before or after, receive Holy Communion, um, you know, pray for the Holy Father's intentions mm -hmm. with the three prayers. But that, that last part is the kicker, uh, detached from even venial sins, and to be honest with you, we st all most of us still have some little uh, attachments, some pleasant sure. memories of things we did and we knew was wrong, but you know, and so you have to work on it. All right, Nello, there you go. Thank you so much uh, for your call. Appreciate hearing from you today in Minnesota. Here's a, uh, a quick reminder that if you uh, call right now, if you've got a question for Father John, we can probably get you on today's show. Eight three three. 288-EWTN, or at least we'll give it the old college try here. 833-288-3986. Let's go to Miguel in Oklahoma City, listing on Oklahoma Catholic Broadcasting. Hey, Miguel. Uh, Miguel is still being screened. Let me ask you a question from Kevin. Kevin wants to know, what is the Catholic position of imputed righteousness? What is that, Father? Okay, well, there's a distinction in theology between imputed righteousness and infused righteousness. Okay, Imputed righteousness is a Protestant uh, theological concept that, in a sense, God just gives you righteousness and you really don't have much to do with it. You know, you, you believe, it happens. Uh, Council of Trent, the Catholic Church, and it's in the Catechism, we believe in an infused righteousness. That means God offers, but we have to uh, cooperate with it. We have to accept it. And so that's why, you know, after we're, you know, we, we need to be baptized, mm -hmm. we must also accept all the actual graces that God offers to us. So um, Martin Luther and Calvin had this idea that righteousness is just like a juridic thing. You know, it's like the governor pounding the gavel. You're, 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 you know, you've been pardoned. In Catholic theology, we see it as a medicinal thing. 
that you know uh, we've been wounded by original sin. Mortal sin is is deadly to the soul, but God's grace has the ability. All right, but we also must cooperate with it, and then therefore we're healed and we're restored. Okay, appreciate that. And here's a question now from Peter: Why did John the Baptist baptize Jesus? Uh, Jesus' baptism was not a sacrament. It was not something that was necessary for his spiritual welfare because he's the second person of the Trinity, and he is all grace, all truth. But it was a symbolic gesture because Jesus represented all men and women. His sacred humanity was hypostatically united to his divine nature, and therefore in the one divine person of Jesus, his baptism was a ceremonial it wasn't uh, trivial, uh-huh. but it was symbolic. It was ceremonial. Uh, he represented the human race. But you and I, we needed to be baptized because that's our individual application of what Jesus did on Good Friday to us. Peter, thanks for your question. Here is Michael in Boise, Idaho, listening on the great Salt and Light Radio. Michael, what's on your mind today? Hi. Um, I was recently at a church group um, where the subject of praying the rosary devotion uh, came up. And a couple members of the group were essentially um, saying that they weren't comfortable praying the luminous mysteries, um, (laughs) suggesting that they were perhaps either somehow illegitimate or less legitimate. I think, I think their phrase was, well, they weren't, they weren't handed down by directly by Mary to St. Dominic. And so therefore, suggesting that they're not really fully legitimate. Mm. And I was just wondering, what, like, what's the Church's um, either teaching or tradition? Obviously, Luminous is pretty recent in the last 20 years, yes. but I was just wondering what the, what the Church's position is on that matter. Okay. Okay, well, we go back to Matthew's Gospel, when Jesus gave the keys to St. Peter, and he says, whatever you declare bound on earth is bound in heaven, whatever you declare loosed on earth is loosed in heaven. So the Pope has full uh, immediate, universal uh, primacy. He has full authority and sacramentals, and the rosary is a sacramental, it's not a sacrament. The Pope cannot add or detract any of the seven sacraments anymore. He can the Ten Commandments, but any of the sacramentals, he can suppress, he can create a new one, he can uh, adjust or modify. So even though Mary gave St. Dominic uh, the rosary, uh, it was the Holy See that abbreviated because the original rosary was all 150 all right, uh, Hail Marys. Yeah. And it got to be too much for the typical layperson, so uh, they abbreviated or bridged it so that we have, you know, just the five, uh, the, the 50 um, that we do now. Uh-huh. Um, but the Luminous Mysteries were under the full authority of Pope John Paul, Supreme Roman Pontiff. So if anybody's got a problem with that, they got a problem with the Pope's authority. That's right. Appreciate that. And here is Willie now in Columbia, South Carolina, listening on WZJO. Hey, Willie, what's on your mind today? Thank you for taking my call. I'd like to know what were eunuch and what were their purpose. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll have to handle this del- delicately. Very okay. delicately. <laughs> uh, eunuchs were, uh, were a class of servants uh, in uh, pagan culture um, who, these were men who were cast- castrated so that they could take care of the uh, the king or whoever the emperor's harem was. And since they were castrated, there was no threat of them uh, doing anything with the, the wives or the girlfriends or whatever the king or potentate had. Um, and so they were a class of rulers. And the pagan um, monarchs used them in particular uh, situations, certain jobs, certain uh, officials. Uh, it wasn't uh, across the board, uh, thankfully. Uh, but when the with the it was never existed among the the Jews or the Christians, and once um, Christianity became legalized in 313 with the Edict of Milan, and then later in the 380s it became the state religion of the Roman Empire, uh, it sort of just uh, completely fell off. All right, and uh, Willie, thank you so much uh, for your question. Bill wants to know why would Jesus frequently perform a miracle and then tell people to keep it secret. <laughs> Uh, yes, that was a test of, of obedience ah. because, uh, you know, there's that one just we had recently where he said to the guy, go tell no one, and the guy blabs. Yep. And, uh, you know, it, it's part of this, what they call the messianic secret, is that Jesus, you know, wants us to be obedient. And if he says, be quiet, you be quiet. Now, he knew, of course, being God, that the guy was going to blab anyway, but it was a sign to us that this is not a, a good example. 
that although the man was miraculously cured, okay, he was told to say nothing to anyone, and he did. He did. All right. And Dan is listening in Hastings, Nebraska, on the Great Spirit Catholic Radio. Dan, what's on your mind today, sir? Well, thank you for taking my call. Uh, I just wondered, what's the correct way to get a spiritual director? It seems like, you know, the priests of my parish are so busy, and I, I don't know that I want to bother them with that. <laughs> mm. So, okay. Yes, and um, although every priest should be willing and available, uh, some of them just don't have the, I mean, they're, they're, they're stretched thin because some priests have three, four, five parishes. I had two, and that 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 was not not easy. But I know some of my brother priests have more than that. Yeah, and uh, some of them also have hospitals to take care of. I would say first find um, uh, go to the retirement home, uh, the priest retirement home. There's some elderly priests who are still with, have all their marbles and they're you know uh, they're able. Maybe they can't get around town, but you could go visit them and maybe uh, go to spiritual direction to them. Uh, there might be a religious community, um, you know, like the the CFRs, uh, the Fathers of Mercy. Uh, there are Dominicans. There's so many wonderful. Yeah. Uh, you got the Eternal Word uh, missionaries, <laughs> Franciscans. Yes. Um, so any of those solid religious, you can go to uh, parish priest. You know, again, ask, and if he says he can't, all right, you know, don't take it the wrong way. Um, you can also call the diocese. Sometimes they have a list of available mm. uh, spiritual directors, but also at retreat houses, you know, legitimate ones that are, again, orthodox, uh-huh. you can go and say, priests available for spiritual direction. Good idea. All right, and uh, Nancy has a question. Can the Pope make changes to fundamental doctrine, like the traditional nature of marriage? No. Anything that is a substantive element of the sacrament. So just like he can't change uh, the fact you have to use water and uh, invoke the Holy Trinity when you baptize, he cannot change that. He can't change the fact you have to use wheat bread and grape wine for the Holy Eucharist. Uh, Marriage is between one man and one woman. He cannot change the substance of the sacrament, but he can uh, determine the, the, the liturgical form of it. Okay, very good. And uh, a question here from Jerome. Which parts of the Mass cleanse us of our venial sins? Um, Anytime you receive the sacramentals, if you bless yourself with holy waters, you come into church. Um, The penitential rite, um, some theologians say that that can remit venial sin. Just the fact that you're going to Mass, all right, even uh, though you're, I mean, you're not receiving, but especially if you receive reception of the sacraments, all right, you receive God's grace. Um, it's only through the sacrament of penance and reconciliation that you have a mortal sin removed, but all venial sin is removed through sacramentals or any of the sacraments. Okay, very good. And we'll go out on this question from Angie. How can I explain why we call priests father? <laughs> the same reason you, you would call your dad father, okay? Uh, it's an analogy, uh, just like... Because I know some people say it says in Scripture, call no one father. Well, what, who's your dad? Okay, it's an extension of God's fatherhood. With the Scripture injunction is that no one can replace God the Father, but we have people who, uh, you know, sort of fulfill that fatherly mission. Okay. And there were a few calls we couldn't get to uh, just simply because we ran out of time. But if you folks will call us back tomorrow or on the day of your choice, we'll get you on as quick as we can. Hey, Father, could you please leave us with your blessing? Absolutely. Benedica vos omnipotens Deus, Pater et Filius et Spiritus Sanctus. Amen. Thank you so much, Father John Tregilio. Don't forget tomorrow at the same time, Father Wade Menezes is here to uh, talk about faith, fellowship, and families. Looking forward to that program as well. Until then, I'm Tom Price along with our great team here. Thanks for joining us. See you tomorrow on Open Line on a Tuesday. God bless. The most original and exclusive Catholic content is on EWTN Radio. More to life.